All right. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to see many of you back uh, from yesterday. We had a full uh, of about four hours together. It seemed like it went by really fast. It was just great fellowship, uh, fantastic donuts, even better sandwiches, and uh, even even more wonderful fellowship. I uh, hope you got a handout uh, on connecting with our community. We we'll also will have a handout when it comes time for the uh, the sermon portion. Uh, we're doing five lessons on connections, which I understand is y'all's theme for the year. I th- it's just a, a very biblical theme. The more you study it and think about it, uh, and it's. Uh, I hope the discussion was um, well received yesterday. It's been an encouragement to me just uh, preparing and thinking about some of these thoughts, and uh, and I enjoyed the uh, the Q and A portion uh, yesterday. Well, uh, today what we'll do we're going to start off talking about connecting with our community. And then uh, as I kind of commissioned some of you yesterday, if you wanted to start brainstorming uh, possible ideas uh, toward the end of this lesson, if we, if we get there, we'll, we'll go over and share some ideas with each other, some practical things and things you're already doing, like, uh, like the food bank, the first and second Tuesday of the month, right? Okay. okay, I was close. First and third Tuesday of the month. Okay, so uh, I've never been to Elgin until uh, Friday, but I did a little research on Elgin before I came. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert because I've never really, like I said, been here before. I've been to Chicago once and we drove up for Paul and Kelsey's wedding. uh, And that was my only uh, stint here in the north. Uh, I think you call this the north, right? Uh, Like straight up. And and so, uh, but Elgin, uh, Illinois, I remember uh, I did a little research. And so as I came into the city, we're driving and I saw the Fox River. That's the Fox River. That's where they decided to build the settlement over here in the 1800s because I was kind of researching a little bit of the history and, and the origin. So I'll go over some of the stats and let's see if it if appears accurate or not. And then we'll see what conclusions we can draw when we learn about our community. So Elgin, it's apparently in the Cook and Kane counties, uh, 35 uh, miles northwest of Chicago. That seems accurate along the Fox River. Uh, about a population of 112,000 people. Makes it the eighth largest state in Illinois. There will be a quiz at the end of this, so hopefully you're taking notes. Uh, so uh, going back to 1830, there was something called the Indian Removal Act, and there was the Black Hawk Indian War in 1832, which led to the expulsion uh, of a, a number of actually uh, Native Americans who are here. Here, uh, previously and so it's like now what do we do with this this piece of land there was a guy from New York named uh, James Gifford and James Gifford and his brother were looking for a ripe area of settlement along the Fox River that could have a bridge that could go across and so in 1835 they established this area uh, made it a city and named it after a Scottish song actually a Scottish tune called Elgin so that's how you got the name. I don't know the tune. I don't going to make up one or anything like that. Does anybody actually know the Scottish Elgin tune? Okay, so <laughs> let's continue on. Uh, this was a place that uh, really uh, did well in the butter and dairy goods industry. They actually, a lot of the butter and dairy goods were sent to uh, Chicago, and that became a, a big source of income. Someone named Gail Borden established a condensed milk factory in 1866. Apparently, the local library is named after uh, Borden and uh, has, why do I even know this, 460,000 volumes in there. <laughs> uh, we drove by and Paul pointed it out. I'm like, that's the Borden Library. Cool. Uh, as, and then the, the Elgin Watch Company uh, really took off uh, years later in the uh, late 19th, mid 20th centuries. It became one of the largest producer of fine uh, watches. Uh, actually, the, the big clock in Union, uh, Union um, Station in Chicago, remember when we were over there? I go, let's go look at it, it has Elgin on it. Uh, you know, it was a large, Elgin was a large watch company. But o- over time, the factory did close its productions in 1865, and it says it was torn down in, not 1860, 1965, and in the summer of 1966, it was torn down. Uh, Elgin High School apparently has produced a number of pretty talented people does anybody actually go to Elgin High School in here? No? Okay. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and say this. I'm assuming all, everybody, all the other high schools are good too, but as far as Elgin High School, it's produced five Na- Navy admirals, one Nobel Prize winner, one Pulitzer Prize winner, a Tony Award winner, two Academy Award winners, some Olympic athletes, and a GM, General Motors CEO, have all graduated from Elgin High School. thought it was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, let's see, it's 37 square miles, an average temperature uh, of cold, or what it would specifically, <laughs> an average high of 58, an average low of 38 uh, around, across the whole year. Uh, let's see, 1920, a bad tornado apparently came through 
uh, Elgin and destroyed a number of businesses like including the Opera House and the Grant Theater. Uh, they call it the Palm Sunday tornado. Killed, it says there's four people, which is still awful, but uh, demographically, it's very mixed. Uh, uh, it's a very mixed culture, mixed, mixed ethnicities here. Uh, it's grown uh, quickly. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, there was 20% growth each decade. So it went from 63,000 in 1980, and by 2000, it was 94,000 residents. And then it's had a little, it still has been growing since, but uh, we're showing here in 2016 about 112,000, and not as um, quick growth as it has been in decades previously. There apparently is a pretty, uh, somewhat of a, a 4% Laotian um, um, uh, residents here. I've never, I don't know if there's a Laotian restaurants or Laos restaurants or a couple of businesses. I've, I haven't got a chance to <laughs> tour the town too much. But uh, let's see. There's 35,000 households. 38% of them have children under the age of 18. 52.6% are married couples living uh, together. 13% are homes of a female householder with no husband present. And 28% of the households are non-families. Uh, the median age is 32.5 years uh, of age, and the average household income is $56,000. Uh, so uh, I guess I could keep going on, but I'll, I'll probably wrap it up here in a moment. Uh, let's see. Um, it became a city chartered by the state of Illinois in 1855. First city to have a council manager uh, system of government. I don't know. If that might be in the quiz. Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, apparently, did y'all know, uh, I, we didn't get a chance to look at it, it has one of the largest municipal recreation centers in the United States. Is it pretty big, recreation center? I mean, like a swim area, it has a climbing wall, it says. We should have went there, that would have been fun. <laughs> but apparently it's huge. Um, and let's see what else you might find. Oh, free curbside textile uh, recycling for residents in Elgin. Uh, and in one of the largest con concentration of cobblestone homes. Does anybody have a cobblestone home? I don't know why I would say that, but it did. Okay, this is disturbing. Uh, apparently, there's been a number of like horror movies filmed in this area. I don't know if you knew this. Uh, you, you have scenes from like Nightmare in Elm Street, uh, The Purge, Plastic, all were primal fear, have scenes in uh, Elgin. But then there's some lighter tone movies like Dennis the Menace in 1993 <laughs> was, was set here. And uh, things like that. Prison Break had an episode uh, here at a hotel uh, and, and things like that. So, oh, and Roseanne apparently has a couple scenes that were in Elgin. So um, there isn't really a quiz. But with all that, you know, what can we learn about our, our, your community? Uh, I think I did the same thing with Keller, just trying to learn about where I'm from and our community and the people that live there and the people that come there. And then the more I studied it, I found out, I, you know, I had everyone raise their hand if you're from like Keller City Limits and only half raised their hand. And so how many people are actually live in Elgin? So like a, a fifth of the, of the congregation live in, lives in Elgin. Y'all live in Elgin right there, right? So uh, not a whole lot. And so you, you think about it, wow, what can we learn about our community? Well, uh, and then I heard two people this weekend say the term Chicagoland. And I guess that would mean does Chicago and all the suburb areas, Chicago land. Is that a common expression? Uh, and you, you're very connected. Uh, we took the train to go into the city. Uh, you know, there you have the direct, you know, the Elgin to Sh Union Station. There's, there's train stations, there's, there's buses. We, our hotel's right in front of, there's a bus, little station in front. What is it, P-A-C-E, PACE? Is that how you pronounce it? I, I forget, it's an acronym, but that, that takes little trips all over the place. Um, you're very connected. We live in a very connected society, don't we? I mean, it's not, uh, I think years ago, people, this is more theory based, were more willing to go to a congregation in their own backyard than go, you know, traveling somewhere. But as transportation be has become easier and, and uh, people are willing to travel a little bit, to find a congregation where they could work, they can serve and, and to be. And uh, I don't think that's a reflection on the church declining because congregations, there's not as many. I think people are willing to go different places uh, nowadays. Uh, here's just some observations I, I found. Maybe you can add some observations yourself. Uh, it seems like this is a very nice place to be. Uh, just driving through here this week, and it's a nice place. It's a, uh, the education appears to be good, uh, a very nice um, median income. It, it's a lot of restaurants, a lot of places to go. It's a neat, neat nice place, very blessed community. Uh, I'm thinking in here, 
uh, are mostly first and second generation uh, Elginites. I don't even know. Only five people raised their hand. But I don't know. Does anybody have like deep roots in this area right here? So it's a lot of people may have been moved here over the years. Uh, let me think. It's a younger age community, average age of 32. Uh, let's see. Um, it's diverse population. Only half of the residents are, have a traditional family. I think that's important to know. That if you, you, know, you preach to a traditional family, well, half of the community statistically is not a traditional family. So you just got to weigh that in. Weigh that in. Uh, easy travel, being able to get around uh, uh, pretty easy around here. Uh, what, what other observations do you have on our, your community? You may want to share an observation. <laughs> Okay. But the weekends, everybody's home. Oh, interesting. See, these are good observations to know. If you're going to try to do something big during the week, well, are a lot of people going to be here during the week? Maybe the weekends are a better option. Any other observations on your community? There is a, a heavy I had something on here, too, about like mainline uh, denominations seem to be more prevalent up north. And down south, we have a lot of... Uh, like non-denominational type churches and things like that. And I know they're here too. You know, we talked about some that are around as well, but you'll find like a, a larger like Lutheran base and Catholic base up north as opposed to down south. I mentioned this yesterday that there's 15 churches of Christ within 15 miles of my house or from our, our congregation. Just gives you an idea. Of, it's just uh, more spread, uh, spread around down south. Um, what are some other observations you might note? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Paul drove us by the, uh, the the Iglesia de Cristo, and and I, and uh, he was telling me about. It, and they might have used to meet here. I understand, and uh, are doing very well. And and, uh, and that's really positive to hear. He said about 100, 150 members, maybe. I don't know. And that's a that's really nice. That's a nice established church. Um, down south, we have a lot of Iglesia de Cristos that are smaller groups that are typically connected with an English-speaking congregation that's like a, like a ministry. They're not really on their own many, and so that's, that's neat. And uh, uh, what other observations might you note? Well, I, I would suggest there's a westward expansion of the city limits, and, and so as we go out west, you'll notice uh, some of the evangelists Evangelistic churches are, are established out that way huh. and, and uh, attracting the younger families. So that's where people are, you know, are establishing their families and and so places of worship out there, like on Nestor Road, there's a, some large uh, evangelistic churches yes. out there that are prospering. And in fact, this weekend they they did a uh, a little survey at my house, and so it shows up. Every couple of years, they'll come by and and friendly and have a handout, and so they're in they're into the community. Interesting, yeah. yeah. And they're and they're thinking ahead. If that's where all the expansion is going, they're doing a lot of things out that direction. Uh, I was amazed how uh, this road right here seems to connect everything right here. This what is it called, Randall Road? I mean, I didn't like it was so easy to get here, and it's easy to get. I haven't even had to pull my map up too much. I, it's just right down back and forth. So this you know this is right off the, a, a good main road as well. well. I'll make a comment about Randall. It's just in the Kane County and going yes. north of Duke McKinley. Identified as a strategic uh, main main fair huh. through through several counties and and extends all the way up um, into Algonquin and down well it goes all the way down to uh, the, the other end of Kane County and Interesting. Octavia and, and so it's uh, it had. It, it was designed to be this type of road. That's, I'm glad the people thought ahead. Uh, our congregation's off this, there's a main road, and it's like back a row. And so you actually can't see it from the main road. You just have to kind of know it's there. And it, sometimes I wish we were out a little bit more so we would get more exposure. I think it's... We've got a, a community college, and then we have Judson University, which is oh, okay. Christian University. Okay. Uh, that's, that's good to know, too, if you uh, have... Uh, college students or campus ministry type things to consider and things like that. So I, I do want to kind of segue from once we start to point out some just basic observations about our community, I want to think about the community as, as, man, as humankind. Uh, and I want to think, here's an article I came across called The Top 10 Things People Want in Their Life But Can't Seem to Get. 
the top 10 things people want in life but can't seem to get. And I think this will relate to people in Fort Worth, Texas, as well as Elgin, Illinois. And so here are some of the answers that people gave to this question. If you could say in one word, what would you want more in life? What would it be? Okay, so in one word, if you could have more of this in life, what would it be? So those who are filling this out, the top 10 things people, uh, people want in life but can't seem to get. Okay, here is the, their answers. The top 10 were happiness, money, freedom, peace, joy, balance, fulfillment. We're going to go over these one by one. So if you're trying to write this down, <laughs> fulfillment, confidence, stability, and passion. Okay, now I believe that summarizes what most people in every community will answer. Would you say that's accurate? This is what people want. These are, these are things that people are looking for. Happiness, money, freedom, peace. And we'll go, we'll go through some of these. So it doesn't really matter what geographical area you are. There's still going to be the same quote unquote wants and desires and longings that people are seeking. I, I will go ahead and tell you the universal solution I, I, I'm convinced of. And then we'll kind of emphasize it with each point. The universal solution for uh, all people's problems needs and desires um, and I hope this doesn't sound like you know the typical um, Bible answer but it I am convinced this is the answer is, is Christ if people are in Christ you will find the solution in being in Christ and when you you know biblically how to be in Christ you you uh, believe the gospel you obey the gospel you're baptized into Christ so when you're in Christ this is going to be a solution to every longing every desire every need to every um, demographic to every uh, person in each whatever community it may be in Christ is a, a universal uh, message and it's very appealing uh, because people outside of Christ not in Christ there's always going to be a missing link there's always going to be a, a, a longing a lostness a confusion an emptiness uh, I, I can you know I was thinking of somebody I saw on social media uh, a couple months back basically denounced their Christian faith and said that they had found a sense of, of peace and freedom and and I think they are now are very far removed from that they think there's a temporary lack of maybe restriction or uh, they feel like they're free in a sense but they're guarantee there's a major missing piece now in their in their life and uh, and so being in Christ I'm convinced is the umbrella to the uh, to all of these what I would say maybe say superficial answers that people gave to that survey these are things that I want and you want but in Christ We'll find all of these. We'll find it. Uh, so one, one, number one was like happiness. People long uh, for happiness. And, and e the article went on to say, here's the biggest challenge associated with this longing. And so they wanted ch happiness. And the challenge was not knowing what I, I want. And, and I think that's so, so important. We ha I heard a lesson on disappointment. Our, our uh, preaching minister did recently. And he just talked about disappointment and talking about some of the expectations we give ourselves, we, uh, sometimes a lack of, of goals that we're, we're seeking. Um, happiness is such a unique term in Scripture. I mean, with Christianity, I call it kind of a paradoxical life. It's very, it's very, it's not conventional. It's very different than what, you, you know, we would come up with on our own, outside of, and just in our own wisdom. It's very flip-flop, like you you gain when you lose. You you live when you die to yourself. It's all it's all paradoxical. It's all kind of kind of flip flopped. Uh, I think about the beatitudes uh, in that description of, of being blessed or or being happy uh, in, in Matthew chapter five. Uh, you you find a very backwards uh, mentality. It's so so different. But once you do it and you 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 actually do what God wants you to do and practice these these attributes, you you'll find happiness and blessedness but it says you know blessed are the poor in spirit why for there's the kingdom of god blessed are those who mourn because they're comforted the meek they inherit the earth those who hunger and thirst they're satisfied the merciful receive mercy the pure in heart see god the peacemakers are called sons of god those who are persecuted uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven and, and so uh happiness is very uh at times, it's not even tangible. It's not something that's physical or material. Uh, a lot of it has to do with perspective and, and understanding. And I'll talk about that in the next point with, with money. The term happy is found you know, 28 times in the entire uh, King James Version of the Bible. And uh, I like this description. It says, a survey of those texts that have the word happy. 
reveals that happiness, as viewed by the Creator, always has to do with a spiritual exercise. It is a service to God that embodies an eternal hope. I think it's a neat uh, kind of conclusion to the a study in the word happiness, that it's always associated with your service to God. That's where you find ultimate meaning, an ultimate purpose, an ultimate blessedness. And the, the neat thing about this is there's nothing you can do to earn God. He's available, and there's a way to have God and to know God. And so, uh, so you in Christ, you can find happiness, and you, can, you don't have to wait for it or seek for it or pay for it. it it's, it's available. You know, somebody, another answer that was found in this survey, that the second uh, most common answer was people want money, more money. And their most, the, the challenge is not having enough money or time to accomplish the things that they want to do. I remember my first job, and you might uh, be able to recall your first job, but I only made $5.15 an hour, and uh, did anybody have less than that on their first job? Oh, yeah. Okay, every hand went up. <laughs> well, how, much did you, how much did you make an hour? Oh, $1.25 started. $25 an hour? No, $1.25. $1.25. 25. Oh, man. Uh, okay, well, I thought I was rich when I was getting five fifteen an hour uh, at 16 years old, and I used all that money on in, in just taking Candace to a movie or something like that, and I thought I'd all, everything was all taken care of. Now I make a little bit more than that, and I, I, I do not feel rich anymore, but I think it's all perspective. It's all, life, it's all situational. It's all about how you learn contentment. It's what the Bible talks about, and uh, I, I know that in Christ... I really am rich. Uh, and there's a scripture, one of my favorite scriptures in, in all of the New Testament, especially is 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. I just love this passage and it helps me keep things in perspective. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, For you know that the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. I love that verse. In Christ, I'm rich. I have everything I, I, I ultimately will need. I know that there's concerns, and the Bible talks a lot about actual money, and, and a good portion of the parables actually deal with, with money, and it's a, there's no running away from it. But it's also what Philippians 4, verses like 10 through 13 talks about, about how, having to learn contentment, learning how to do well, and, and then how to go through the, the downs. But bottom line, in Christ, you're always uh, rich. Uh, in, in the materialism challenge, uh, you know, the test of showing that money equals happiness always fails, always fails. If, if you ever get a chance uh, from a global um, understanding to travel to countries that don't have as much, you can still find happiness even in less materialistic countries. So there's, a, there's obviously a correlation, but in Christ, you find Richness, uh, freedom, number three, uh, is something that people long for and want. They want freedom. Uh, and they would say something like, this is the biggest challenge. Having the freedom to find my true purpose. You know, what, what in the world is my purpose in life? I want the freedom to find my purpose. I, want, I don't want to have to work two jobs or full time. I want to be able to retire so I can have the freedom to do what I want. Well, what is it that we really want? What, what can really set you free? Well, there's a number of scriptures I would go to. I would look at John uh, 8, 32, 36. You know, the truth, you shall know the truth, and truth will set you free. And then verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Uh, I would also uh, partner and couple the verse uh, Galatians 5, 13 with that. Galatians 5, 13, uh, for freedom, uh, it says, talks about, uh, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. My, my purpose is now. I can have freedom, freedom now. Even if you're, you're completely busy with uh, raising kids or your job or whatever it might be, there's still freedom and purpose is discovered now when you're in Christ. I, I just love that verse. Use your freedom to love and to serve one another. That, that, you don't have to wait for that. That's now. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, no matter how long we do this, this case study in life, we'll always have this conclusion. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this, I like where it says the whole of man. Some words, translations add duty, but the idea is just the whole of man. This is who man's supposed to be, uh, people. All right, number four, peace. People want peace. They want more peace. Uh, and it, I think this has to do with the question of 
Who am I? The who am I question, the, the challenge associated with peace in this article said the lack of clarity about who I am. Well, if you know who you are, you're going to discover uh, peace. Um, in Philippians 4, verse 7, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind, uh, minds in Christ uh, Jesus. We under, I, I love this, this expression um, that we say, remember uh, who you are and, and whose you are. You ever heard that expression before? You, all, I I'm saying y'all a lot, haven't I? <laughs> Do you all, uh, or have you heard this expression? <laughs> it, uh, the expression is, is who you are and whose you are. I like that expression. Um, all right, number five. Uh, we're going to keep moving because I need to get some other stuff. Joy. People want joy. They're seeking joy. They want joy. Can you find joy in Christ? Uh, spoiler alert. Every point is yes. You can find whatever the fill in the blank is in Christ. The biggest challenge people say with joy is finding the right role or position in their life that will bring joy. But again, it's all about perspective. It all is about big picture perspective. Joy can be found now. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say uh, rejoice. Joy is not based on any external factors. I mean, joy, you can find the emotional feeling of joy on temporary measures, something fun, something exciting, something whatever, but that's still ultimately temporary. If you've been to the happiest place on earth, you're still going to have a great time there, but eventually that subsides. You go through whatever it is, it is always going to be temporary. So it's not based on external factors. Joy can be continual when you had the perspective of eternity. So it's all about how you understand joy. Joy is found in the Lord, in Christ. So the good, the bad, the ugly times, it's, you can still have joy. Joy will ultimately shine because you can see the, the big picture of things even when there's temporary struggles. I, I've given this a lot of thought. And, and so I think, to me, joy is a, becomes a byproduct of God's love dwelling in my heart. And then from that ah. point of view, it's somewhat the opposite of, of happiness. In other words, joyfulness is a matter of extending God's love huh. in, in word and deed. Yes. And so that, that, that produces joyful, joyful yes. living in your heart. Yes. And so that, that's, that's... I like what, that. That's what I learned in my married life. Mm, I, and I love that uh, explanation uh, in using terms like produces, overflowing, all that's so biblical and like the fruit of the Spirit that you produce that fruit and it, that's what comes as a result uh, of being uh, in Christ. It produces joy, love, hope, uh, I mean, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I always have to sing the song to remember them in, in order. Uh, balance. Okay, we need uh, number six, balance. People want balance in their life. They want to be able to balance uh, their, their life and their priorities. And the article actually, even though I didn't agree with a lot of the article because it was, it was not a religious article, there was an, uh, a statement that said, you have to know your priorities and what you won't compromise on. Now, I agree with that. If you know what you stand for and you know your priorities and you know it's the center of your life, everything else, decision making, becomes a lot easier when you know your standards, when you know what you represent and who you represent, decision-making is not as difficult because you know what you m won't compromise on and you're, you're going to stand firm uh, for Christ and His kingdom. Uh, number seven, fulfillment. People want fulfillment in their life. They want, they want to find that ultimate fulfillment. What is my ultimate goal in life? Well, uh, if you've read the book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, what, what is step number one? Begin with the end in mind. I believe that's number one, at least. It's one of the seven. I think it's the first one, though. If you begin with the end in mind, it's so much easier. As a Christian, I begin whenever I went under the water and was coming up in the newness of life, I began with that by knowing I want to be with the Lord one day in heaven. So therefore, I'm going to have this state of fulfillment that if I'm walking in the light... I get to be with the Lord one day. I get to be with the Lord. Not, not only one day, in a sense, the Lord's with me, but I ultimately get to reside with Him uh, for eternity, which is beyond our even comprehension. And so, uh, Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, you, you, you've heard, uh, there's different uh, stories that people tell about uh, someone, a, a dad talking to his son about, you know, what, what do you want 
in life? What, what do you want to do after you graduate high school? He goes, well, I want to go to college. And then, and, and, and then what? Well, then I want to get a good job. Okay, then what? Then I want to get married. Then what? Then I want to have children maybe. And then what? Then I want to retire. Then what? Then I want to travel the world. Then what? And then I suppose I'm going to die. And then what? You know, what is really our ultimate fulfillment and ultimate goal and ultimate destination? And you can find that in, in Christ, you will find ultimate fulfillment. Uh, number eight, uh, confidence. People want confidence. And this is actually a word found 21 times in the New Testament. Now, my confidence is not found in Spencer or, or serving the Lord or preaching his word. My, 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 my confidence is found because of the Lord, not because of anything I've done. Okay? Remember, he who boasts, ooh, the Bible tells us that we can only boast under one <laughs> a stipulation. Does anybody remember 1 Corinthians 1.31? He who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. I'm only going to promote Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything I do needs to be hidden behind the cross. It's about, about Jesus. Uh, he's the forefront. And because of Jesus, I have confidence. I have confidence in my prayer. I have confidence in the afterlife. I have confidence to go before his throne. Hebrews 4 in verse number 16. Uh, next uh, is stability. People want stability in their life. Uh, and, and you'll find, again, you'll find this in Christ. Uh, I, I need to just go, I'm just going to mention it and move on. Next is, number 10 is passion. People want passion in their life. I'm telling you, you want passion, get in Christ. Because Christ is your motivation. Christ will push you forward. He'll push you through the inconveniences. Romans 12, 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve uh, the Lord. I love that verse. Uh, when he's our core, he's your motivation. He, he's what overflows in your life. Uh, passion. Oh, I love that expression. We could do a whole lesson on that. Okay, so those are the top 10 wants that people seek. And I'm convinced those are universal needs of everybody in Elgin, everybody in Keller, everyone in between, and everybody around the world. And every, until the Lord returns, those will be basic longings people have. But bottom line, we're in Christ. That's, all, that's the whole of man. Uh, the sphere of God keep his commandments. And so we looked at some statistics. We've looked a little bit about our community. We've looked at some of these things. <laughs> now what? Now what? Bottom line, everyone needs Jesus. So how can we point people in our community to Christ? Even though uh, we want to teach them everything we know about the Bible, how can we get people initially to Christ, in Christ, to learn the, the blessings and the benefits and the glory of, of serving uh, the Lord? And so uh, I have, um, I'm going to ask this question, you know, what are some things you're doing in your community? What are then possible ideas that we can bring? And uh, I'll share just one minute worth of some of the things that we try to do, and then I'll let you all uh, add to that. Well, how about I let you all start, and then I'll add if it's quiet. Because <laughs> then, I, uh, again, I love sharing ideas, because you all might be doing something like the food, the food bank, we don't do that. But that's fantastic, the food pantry. And, and then we might do something that you might think, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe we could do that. So all we're doing is just sharing ideas here. And then we'll talk about the execution. <laughs> you know, that's where it gets fun. All right, so go ahead. Does anybody want to add any comments now? How many families do we serve, Peggy? Well, we serve uh, on an average of eight, 80 families. Wow. Every, every first and third Tuesday? Is that what it is, first and third Tuesday? Some, actually, I saw y'all's bulletin. Do y'all have a bulletin? What do you have? Did I, did I see y'all? Y'all actually keep a number of, yeah, the food person served. So, uh, so an average of 80, this past, February stats was 312 people served. I mean, that's excellent. So they all come here. And, anyway, so that's, a, that's just a very huge. Uh, I'm a major proponent of, uh, of benevolence. Uh, and then doing when Jesus did benevolence, he would always try to point people. The whole reason of benevolence is to point people to Christ. Um, Jesus said, you know, the poor is always going to be with you. And, uh, and whenever we used to, remember at Bedford, and we changed this, we used to have someone come in and they say we have a need. And it was like, okay, let's help them. Then they, they would just announce uh, there's a basket in the back. If anybody wants to put money in it after services, it's good. And so afterwards, they put some money. We give it to that person, they would leave, and that was that was the extent of it. And I've always and I try to encourage us that we need to somehow, somehow, if we can, uh, plant some seed with them, plant some Bible study material, try to talk with them. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this 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 is the hard part. But we're supposed to do our part. Our part's to help, right? Our part's to help somebody. Now, if they 
just want to take advantage of that, that that's between them and the Lord. Our goal is just to help and, and then to ultimately to soften hearts for the gospel. But uh, I think that's fantastic. Um, whenever there's uh, the food pantry and things, do you all uh, sometimes give like Bible materials or little tracts or contact information, anything like that? Yeah, house to house. House to house is fantastic. I think that's, that's so, so awesome. And they're going to probably be more willing to read it now that you've helped them. Jesus fed the 5,000, and then I guarantee you he did some teaching, you know what I mean, and, and some preaching. Um, the whole reason why there was miracles was to confirm that this message is going to be true. It wasn't just to, to blindly, it was to ultimately to point him to the deeper spiritual need. Uh, Peter, remember their, their guy, the people were wanting help. He's like, look, silver and gold I don't have, but one thing I do. I can teach you the message of Jesus, but then he heals him and all that. Uh, I think that's fantastic. I, I wish, are y'all partnering with anybody when you do the food pantry, or is it just solely work of the church here? It's our ministry here. I, I love that. We have helpers from, yeah. from different areas. Come over oh, sure. Okay. But yeah, it's coordinated here. Okay. Oh, man. I wonder, there's got to be a way. Okay. Yes. Uh, Paul actually gave me a tour and I go, man, y'all have some green beans down there. <laughs> I might take a, some home with me. Uh, what, what, something else? Let's go ahead. Anybody want to add something else? We did in the fall, of, we call it homecoming and oh, nice. we made an effort to try to see who hasn't been here, who's still in the community that used to be here. Oh, that's good. Uh, invite them and we just had a singing and a potluck. Uh, yes. Meal, and it's kind of about the time Paul and Kelsey came. We a good opportunity to introduce them. And yeah, so like, so, so then the, the new ministers as well can meet people who haven't been here in a while. And, and is, was that a shirt you were wearing uh, yesterday, Mark? Was it, yeah, said cool. something like 2017 homecoming. So, oh, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, I mean, I, I just think about our roles at Keller and how many families have s left. And then sometimes they tell us, sometimes they don't. And then sometimes they say they're going somewhere else. But then maybe it makes you wonder, are they really worshiping somewhere else? Like, I feel like we're, sometimes we're in the same team with other congregations. I'm like, if you can't serve here faithfully, I'm happy if you're serving somewhere else faithfully. But if that's not happening, we, we want you in the Lord serving somewhere. Uh, and I, oh, I got to write these down. Okay, <laughs> what else What else do you want to share? Homecoming. Well, because of our visibility, you know, our yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, Lord willing, maybe um, uh, like sometimes we do domestic like mission trips with the church and we go and serve other congregations and we do like these VBSs and help uh, get into the community. Uh, like if, you know, if I were here, you know, getting some of the teenagers with signs, you know, advertising VBS, just holding it up right there would be, you would get so much attraction. So that, you know, hold the sign up. Uh, it's like the little, we have a little pizza place in town. Sometimes they hold up a sign. And you know that where the pizza place is. And the guy, it's like a teenage kid with music in his ears, kind of wobbling around. <laughs> and you know that's where you can get pizza. You can get some attention just because of your, uh, your location. Um, let, me, let me say uh, something here. Um, Y'all have a website, I understand, correct? And uh, I, I do believe that since we live in the in information age, it's so critical to maintain uh, a website as well as a social media page. Um, there's so much traffic that goes on online. Most people nowadays, if you go and visit, you might do it too. If you go travel somewhere, you go on the computer and you look for a church in the area and you kind of want to have a little idea who they are, what it's about, so you're not surprised when you get there. Uh, I think it's so valuable and critical to maintain a, a website. And, and I think social media, uh, uh, if not more on social media, because uh, mo thankfully it's free. A lot of social media is free, so it's not even going to cost much more than just, and this includes your, some of your tech savvy members, it includes maybe a, the younger generation if they want to create an account for uh, whatever platform uh, uh, of social media. But um, I just think that's so, uh, we, the other day I, t I showed our elders about a month ago, I said, uh, some churches have these very fancy like live stream things. It was like a $10,000 project. Put these cameras in and the live stream our sermons. And I said, you know, YouTube's free. <laughs> and thankfully, y'all have a YouTube page. I like that. I, went, Paul, I looked at Paul's sermon yesterday. He had 48 views. 48 people who might not have been here. I mean, unless you viewed it 48 times in a row. Okay. Uh, uh, but what I did is I went on Facebook Live during my sermon and I propped it up and I videotaped myself while preaching. And then by the time uh, the next day came, 700 people had watched it. And, and, and that was free. 700 people who most of them were not at that building listening to God's word proclaimed. So I believe Facebook Live and, and some of these free social media tools, we have to use them. 
like there's the blessings and cursings of social media and, and, and technology. Uh, and there's a lot of bad, but guess what? There's a lot of good too. Uh, we use like World Bi Bible School and we're teaching people in other countries the gospel who would, we wouldn't be able to get there maybe if it were to be dangerous to go there. And we're teaching the gospel for free online. World Bible School used to pay massive postage stamps and all that. Now it's free on the apps and computer and everybody can do it now. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure I said that. Go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's one of the things we do, we all do, we all have Facebook, we all have friends on Facebook, and how easy for us to post, you know, hey, everybody in this area, like last year I went out to California and preached where my parents are, and I had a lot of friends that I went to high school with, and I just put on Facebook, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to be in town this weekend, I'm preaching, love to see you guys at church, and it was just simple and easy, and one of my friends, I didn't even know if he was in an interest, and showed up. <laughs> And, and so sometimes we get so nervous about doing the face-to-face -face and yes. talking and stuff. Yes. But we don't realize what access we have, like you said, on Facebook just to put a simple post about services. Absolutely. Know. Yeah, like yesterday, Candace posted on her Facebook page uh, the flyer here. I mean, that was click. Post done, and all of a sudden you got a, a broad audience, uh, and you never know. Like I've had people, I had people like that live stream sermon that I went to high school with that I've never talked about the Lord with. I was like, what? They liked it? <laughs> they were watching that? It was just kind of, uh, it was um, humbling to me, and at, and at times also kind of a, a, a wake up call. Spencer, I got to do more. I got to try something different, and we got to adapt to the the culture uh, and, and not compromise to the culture adapt to the culture. It's a little bit, I think that's very, very key. And that's what makes some of our congregations that are strong in the faith, that are doing well, is that they're not compromising core doctrine and worship and things like that. They're just adapting how they communicate that message. Uh, and then there's the churches that are doing it wrong, where they're adapting to the culture and changing things. And that's backfiring. It, statistically, it's backfiring. And, or it, they're changing identity. They, they're being forced to change their identity uh, of, of the church. Um, so those are some good points. Um, when I was driving down this road, there's a adopt the highway type sign over here. And if I read it right, I, I don't know if I read it right. It said like, it was like some uh, Christian school, but it said the next hundred and something miles, it, it's adopt the highway. I'm like, they clean up that much highway? Our, our adopt the highway that we did doing Keller is like a mile. So it's long and that mile is a long mile. It seems like when you're picking up trash, but those adopt the highways signs, if you can find those, are free. They're free. You're supposed to do them quarterly, I think. Um, but it, you know, we have one in Keller, adopt the highway, Keller Church of Christ. So it gets a little bit exposure that we're not just here. We're there too. <laughs> we're out, out and about. And so uh, hopefully the road stays clean and we don't <laughs> doesn't then backfire on us. Well, they don't clean the road up. <laughs> uh, all right, let me, let me hear what else do you might, uh, a suggestion or a thought or an idea. I, we're, we're technically over time, but does anybody want to throw out another one? We try to go annually over to a, a children's home, a family services. Oh, that's so good. Center in Valparaiso, Indiana, the services the upper Midwest, and we have connections there, and we'll go over, we support them financially, but then we go over in the spring and break the dead yes. leaves and put the mulch out. So good. You know, try to serve and then also get to have breakfast with the kids. Nice. Um, and then we've had a couple from here who are now serving as uh, house parents. Yes. Over there. You know what's super surprising is if you use, use your local resources. We went into our uh, a, um, to our school counselors in the area during the last two years on the holidays and asked them for names of families that could use assistance during the holidays. And they gave us names and contacts, asked them for permission, and the school gave us the contacts. It was really neat. And so we've been using our school resources. And there are so many things. If, if you just ask, you'd be surprised. What, what you can do. We did this thing uh, on Wednesday with the youth group called the Amazing Service Race this past Thursday. And we made it fun. It was three hours and you had 10 projects, things from like bringing water bottles to the park and passing them out. We've even put like the, our church information around the water bottle. If there's a big like community thing, y'all get a bunch of water bottles with your church information, just pass them out <laughs> with your information on it. Uh, uh, we, did, we went to like the grocery stores. We had to buy food and deliver them to the storehouse. We had to put up stray shopping carts. Uh, we had to what else did we do? It was, it was, do what? Oh yeah, we did anonymous sticky notes of encouragement, put them on people's cars, like you are, you are love, God loves you, just smiley face, random stuff that might have annoyed people, but maybe not. We uh, hung up, they had to hang up door, uh, put door, fl like flyers on people's doors. Like I don't think you have to necessarily knock, 
and stuff, but if you just put the flyer there and let people uh, read, read about it. And that's our culture. We're very private. We're a private culture, aren't we? We, we don't like people come up to our door. It's like, what do you want? You know, I don't trust you. But if you can plant the seed and let them watch it, it could be good. All right, we got to stop. Uh, <sighs> Uh, maybe a, like a round table discussion. You know, wouldn't that be fun? And let's and first get the ideas, and then get the execution, and put the right people, who's that's their talent in, in place. Uh, doesn't always ha it needs to be an elder, deacon, or minister. It's sometimes better not to be an elder, deacon, or minister. So get more people doing it, but they can spearhead it. All right, I, I got to stop. Okay, I got to stop. I'm going to be kicked out of here if I don't. All right, I'm done. <laughs>